Puerto. The attitudes towards them are hardening. Then later, vultures are the latest animals to hit the red line here in South Africa. We look at the reasons why and a solution today. Also, shortly we'll speak to Gary Kirsten as the Proteus say their final farewell ahead of the Cricket World Cup. But first, let's get the day's news from Katrin Malak. Well, hello and welcome to Newsroom. I'm Katrin Malan and let's just take a look at the top stories this morning. The situation appears calm in the Limpopo town of Malemulele and surrounding areas following public violence this week. Police will move to clamp down on unrest so that schooling and services can resume. The area has been shut down for four weeks. Protesters have shut down the town in their demand for a separate municipality after complaints about poor service from Tulamela municipality. The proposed municipality, if you have it established in the current form in terms of uh, how they had uh, uh, designed it, I mean geographically, this is an area that will be heavily dependent on grants. There's no economic base uh, uh, yeah. to, to support this. Moving to Gauteng, a Somali shop owner who is accused of shooting dead a 14-year-old boy in Snake Park Soweto last week will appear in the Pratia Magistrate's Court today. He allegedly fired shots at a group of people who were trying to rob his shop when the boy was killed. The shooting sparked a wave of looting of foreign-owned shops. The Johannesburg bus company Ria Via says they won't operate any of their services for a third day in a row. This as the bus drivers continue to strike. Ria Via spokesperson Dumisani Ntambo says that they will inform the public by the end of business today when they will be operational again. The city of Johannesburg has meanwhile said that its officials are discussing the process of refunding passengers who have loaded funds onto their smart cards for bus services. South African motorists are relieved this morning as fuel prices came down at midnight last night. The petrol price decreased by 93 cents a litre and diesel by 1 rand 2 cents a litre. This coupled with the Reserve Bank's decision last week to keep the repo rate unchanged are seen as signs that pressure on consumers are easing. And then at least 12 people were killed when a Taiwanese Trans-Asia plane carrying 58 people crash-landed in Taipei River in Taiwan. Rescue teams are alongside the plane trying to rescue about 30 people still trapped inside. Before falling into the, before falling into the river, the plane avoided tall buildings, but its wing hit a bridge and a taxi on a bridge. And the 2015 Africa Cup of Nations has entered the semi-final stage. Ivory Coast faced the Democratic Republic of Congo in the first semi-final of the 2015 African Nations Cup in Bata, Equatorial Guinea today. Host Equatorial Guinea and Ghana play in the second semi-final in Malabo on a Thursday, with the final taking place on Sunday. Meanwhile, the referee at the centre of the controversial penalty decision that helped host Equatorial Guinea reach the Africa Cup Nations semi-final has been banned for six months. Well, remember, all those top stories and more are all available on our Newsroom Facebook page. Also, that clip of the plane hitting the bridge, it's all available on our Facebook page as we speak. Remember, keep up with our journalists on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Yevin, back to you. Thank you very much, Katrina. Yes, incredible pictures there. Fortunately, most of the passengers survived. Uh, that plane crash. We'll show you those pictures again a little bit later and take some of your views and some of the pictures that onlookers have taken on their dash cams in their cars and also on their cell phones. But today we'll start with electricity. Seems it's one thing that we're always talking about in South Africa. Eskom says they will most likely implement load shedding again today. This week has been headlined by darkness and darkness to come as Eskom continues to struggle keeping the lights on. There have been reports of long period blackouts and embassies that have evacuation plans in place should we stumble into this darkness. This after it was announced that a unit crashed at the Kuburg nuclear plant. No doubt we are dealing with a crisis, but have we reached a point of going into panic mode or stop, breathe and take a look at what we have as individual households? Are we going to deal with this situation? It appears South Africans have been heeding the call to conserve electricity Many consumers have been making their own plans, buying into renewable energy sources, equipping their homes, and are today smiling as some of their neighbours continue to be in darkness. Has the Eskim situation served as a wake-up call to you and to many others? 
Well, today we are joined by Kadri Nasib, the CEO of the South African National Energy Development Institute. Good morning. Hi, morning, Evan. Mouthful, I've said there. I want to start right at the mm -hmm. top of it. Your views on the kind of hysteria that's doing the round about us going into an extended blackout period, uh, an extended period of, of darkness. How, how do you view this? Well, I think certainly load shedding is a reality. I think the, uh, if you look at it in context, the possibility of a national blackout, that's possibly much more remote. Uh, but the load shedding reality, that's there. And it's due to a number of factors. Uh, I think ESCOM has reported widely on the, on the lack of maintenance, particularly during summer months, which is traditionally when we have to maintain those plants mm. when demand is, is actually much lower. And because that has, hasn't happened to the extent that it was required, we now sit in a situation where we're catching up on maintenance and unfortunately those plants are going out of service at this point in time. Just talk about Senedi, your organization. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how, how do you integrate into the energy sector and, and what do you see as your role really going into the future? Mm -hmm. Well, Senedi has a very unique mandate. We, firstly, we're the state's energy development arm. So we're entrusted with responsibility, which is twofold. Firstly, to help develop new energy solutions and also to integrate existing current best practices into the energy supply and demand sectors. Mm. And then the second most important one in this context, of course, is the mandate with respect to energy efficiency. So it's all about driving programs within the various sectors that comprise demand in this country, whether it's commercial, industrial, residential, yeah. and actually putting together programs that actually support a reduction in energy demand. The plans and the research has been conducted to develop South Africa towards more sustainable and renewable energy. Mm. Where are we? Well, you know, government has run a very successful auctioning system, which is called the Rebid program, and that largely focuses on renewable energy. And as a result of that program, we have just over 1,000 megawatts of new capacity that's been brought online by the private sector. So that does help in terms of mitigating against the impact of load shedding. But at the same time, the overall system requirement is something closer to 5,000 megawatts. Yeah. So there's still a huge shortfall. Now, given the current uh, supply options that we have in the country, as you know, both Madupi and Kusili, the two large coal-fired stations, are both delayed. Yeah. So we're expecting that certainly load shedding will continue for at least the next 18 months. And at the same time, the new power plants that are being constructed by the private sector, which are ma mainly renewable energy ones, are also to some degree delayed by the lack of distribution or transmission infrastructure. So it's a catch-22 situation. Right. So we, we do require further um, demand to be re reduced. And the way to do that is through large energy efficiency programs. And so we're currently in the process now of working together with National Treasury, the main department, which is Department of Energy, and then, of course, the members that are contributing to the war room, which is led by the deputy president, <laughs> yeah. to try and put all that together. We saw there... Uh South Africans are seemingly buying into this. Mm. Are South Africans buying into energy efficiency, living, doing more with less? Or from my point of view and some of the criticisms that we have from, I can only talk from the circle that I'm in, people say things like, oh, but when I drive around town, all the lights are on in all these big buildings, mm. but we have to switch off our fan or whatever it is at home. Mm. But when you drive through cities, the lights are on in all these buildings. So how, how do you balance that? I think there's a range of initiatives that are required. If you start with the residential sector, for instance, most people have a knee-jerk reaction to this and go and look for diesel generators. And a lot of them don't realize, of course, that diesel generators are expensive to maintain and to fuel. Yeah. And, uh, and they, of course, they are polluting as well. So we also try and discourage that, even though we understand that people require electricity, so they have to do that. Um, what you've just mentioned in the context of commercial buildings is a sad reality. In fact, just in the news yesterday, there was lots of discussion about certain companies, and I won't name and shame them, <laughs> but certainly they have left their lights on, and of course they supply us with our landline communications. So yes. anyway, the, reality, <laughs> the reality is that there are companies out there, and they've acknowledged their mistake. And I think that's the important thing. It's a behavioral shift, first and foremost. Yeah. And that's the lowest cost option, is changing behavior. Malls, for instance, uh, leaving lights on in parkades in the middle of the night. It's not necessary. Yeah. You need motion centers to guide people to only have light where they're required. People complain that with street lighting, if you don't light up areas adequately, there'll be increased crime. That's not necessarily true because we find that street lights are on in the middle of the day in some cases. So it's all that. about behavior. It's about behavior. And, but there are a number of other options. For instance, we're looking at possibly getting lead SA involved in helping us to drive corporates to accommodating us with a particular scheme that looks at employees uh, sourcing the relevant uh, appliances and uh, infrastructure to make their homes more greener. 
getting it from the employers and we'll assist them to do that. Quickly, 30 seconds. What, if there's one thing you could tell the consumers at home what they should start implementing to be more sustainable? I think firstly start with behavior. Follow the instructions from ESCOM because they are important. We have a morning and an evening peak. The more we can reduce the morning and evening peak, the easier it becomes for ESCOM to manage the demand. Yeah. So if they cut out the, the non-essential appliances, it is going to make a difference. Diesel generators are last resort. There are other options in the marketplace as well. Converting to gas-fired stoves is a fantastic option. Yeah. Converting to solar water heating, another important option. Lighting, lighting is a huge contributor as well, energy efficient lighting, and then also I would, I would suggest uninterruptible power supplies, UPSs, mainly battery storage. Yeah. If you've got the money, go rooftop PV, get your own PV supplies, it'll help you to, to get through this period. Well, Kadri, thank you, that's fantastic. Much needed advice. At times we are in the dark ourselves as to what <laughs> needs to happen because you try and do it a little bit, but it seems as if not everyone's playing ball and then people lose a bit of faith. But thank you for coming in today Thanks, and, and, and giving us a nice heads up there. That's the CEO of the South African National Energy Development Institute, Kadri Nasip, joined us here this morning. Now we move on to the story buzzing all over social media this morning. At least 12 people were killed when a Taiwanese trans-Asia plane carrying 58 people crash-landed in the Taipei River in Taiwan. Rescue teams are alongside the plane trying to rescue about 30 people who are still trapped inside of this plane right now. Before falling into the river, the plane avoided tall buildings, but its wing hit a bridge and a taxi on the way down. Look at that picture. There are still people trapped in there. These rescue efforts, as you see those pictures, rescue efforts are still underway as they're trying to get 30 more people out of the fuselage of that plane. Incredible picture. Look at that. Once in a lifetime. Maybe we should all think about putting dash cams on our car. Then people can't give you the finger also when they're driving or next to you. Anyhow, let's have a look at some of the tweets that's uh, around on the Courage. Sharia says, Transasia goes down. Pity to the families who had their loved ones in the plane. Taiwan's Civil Aviation Authority says there were three pilots on board the crash Transasia ATR-72. Pilot flying has close to 5,000 flight hours and co-pilot 7,000. Well, it's all good and well if you've got experience, but not if the plane doesn't want to fly anymore. Hans Kropp says, just heard, read about Transasia crashing. I hope the majority of the people are okay. As I know, nine have sadly already died. Yes, we can confirm that 12 people are now confirmed dead, but there's still hopes that 30, might, 30 more might survive. 58 in total were on the plane. Only two deaths so far. Amazing. Transasia, well, the number has moved up to 12 now. There you can see the rescue operation is still underway. Now, today's picture comes from Brian Stelter on the TransAsia flight G235. Captions, have you ever seen a more incredible image from a dash cam? This is TransAsia flight. Thank you very much there to Brian Stelter who sent that picture or who tweeted that picture. That's the pick of the day. I'm sure it's not something that you will see well, every day of the week. These days in the age of social media, well, I suppose that's how it goes. Now, flying out to Australia today for the World Cup is the Proteus. The official send-off for the national team takes place at Mulrose Arch in Johannesburg. But later today, we at News yet Newsroom wish that our national cricket team the best of luck, of course, and hope that, well, they go to Australia and New Zealand and do the nation proud. It's not always about winning. Joining us on the line now is former Protea coach and captain uh, Gary Kirsten, who will be joining the team in Australia and New Zealand. Very good morning, Gary. Thanks for joining us. No problem. How are you doing? Very, very well today, Gary. It must be a, a landmark day for you guys as you're about to head out. I'm sure you're looking, you're looking forward to a great send-off at Melrose Arch. Yeah, I, I personally won't be going uh, just yet. I'm going later on in the, in the tournament, but I think it's great for the for the players to kind of have that, uh, yeah, the, the send-off they will have. I think they've, uh, uh, I think everyone's very excited about the team at the moment. Now, Gary, you've won a World Cup with India. You've been in the hot seat. What do you reckon it's going to take for South Africa to finally get this monkey off our backs? A lot of luck, like most teams need. And um, and I think, yeah, just things kind of taking the process at the right time and having certain individuals that can... Uh, you know, they can take us across the line specifically in those knockout games. But I think, um, 
you know, everyone's excited with the current crop of players. You've got some uh, great players, some experienced players as well that are, that are kind of at the top of their games at the moment. So we can certainly be excited by that. Gary, I want to talk about the, the challenge that's facing the Proteas right now. You've gone to Australia, and, and I'm sure it'll be tenfold now with it being a World Cup. Tell us about the kind of reception that you expect our guys to get there, knowing that the Aussies know that we come as almost, almost favourites. Do you think that uh, they'll get that hot reception you always get in Australia from the media, right down to the fans, to the concierge in the hotel? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there'll be no doubting that. But uh, it was just three, three months ago that we lost the Series 4-1 to Australia. So I don't, I don't think we could claim to, to be going there as favourites. And I think that works in the approach's advantage, to be honest with you, you know, to, to not have a, that ex expectation around them. I think Australia are probably regarded as the clear favourites, um, in my opinion. But, um, you know, there will always be that external noise and there will always be kind of that, that doubt as to whether the you know the Proteas can pull through, and especially in those in those knockout stages. And I think that's I think that's kind of working in the in the in the individuals' favour. They you know they they understand um, that pressure that exists, and I think the players have been as individuals have been through a lot of that before. Um, and as I said, there's there's nothing like experience in that situation to be able to manage those those kind of moments. And I think we've got a group of players. Um, you know, as ready as they're ever going to be to kind of manage that space. Gary, uh, we saw yesterday that uh, the coach, Russell Domingo, came out and, and, and kind of put his hand up on behalf of Wayne Parnell. Is the number seven position in the Protea side the one area that, uh, that concerns you? Or are we as South Africans a little bit too harsh at times on our players? Well, the one thing I can say is I'm glad it's only uh, one position that we're worried about because every other team has got more than one position, that's for sure. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a positive sign. I think we've got a great uh, batting lineup. We know we've got a seam attack that on their day can uh, be the best in the world. And Imran Tay has probably been the best spinner in world cricket at the moment. So, you know, those signs are all positive. There is a bit of, as we know, a grey area kind of around that middle to late order batting, the sort of finishing role that I think is going to be in ver a very important role. But certainly um, someone like Riley Rousseau has shown that he can be a devastating striker of the ball at the back of an innings. And, um, you know, Ferran Bearden, who maybe hasn't quite fired like we would, would like to, to have, has certainly been the best finisher in, in domestic cricket over, over a number of years now. So um, whilst that position kind of isn't cemented yet, um, you know, we've got some we've got some good players who can fill that spot. Gary, quickly, uh, are you are you concerned that uh, one or two players like Quinny de Kock at the top might be a little bit underdone in Australia? Ah, oh, yeah, it's beautiful that uh, play that that he, that he hasn't played too much cricket. I'm I'm a fan of not too much cricket because I think there'll be enough uh, leading into the into the knockout phases. You know the. The first three quarters of the tournament, in many ways, should be a, a walk in the park for the test-playing nations because they don't have to win every game and they should mm. get through to the knockout phases. So, you, you know, you've kind of got five weeks of of a lot of practicing and, and a lot of match playing, um, you know, seven round-robin games plus two warm-up games before you kind of hit the hit the really important part of the, of the tournament. So, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of, of guys really peaking at, at that point in time. So the fact that the, some of the guys haven't played that much cricket, of which Quinton is one of them, um, for me is a, is a good sign. Gary, thank you very much for giving us your insights this morning. That's uh, former national coach, well, best left-hander in my book that ever played for South Africa, Gary Kirsten. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we move on and we take a look now at the front pages from around the globe. In the United States, the Wall Street Journal has a front page picture. They have a child holding a picture of the Jordanian captain who was reportedly executed by the Islamic State yesterday. In Australia, down under, the Daily Telegraph reports three rebel MPs have called to ask Tony Abbott within a week after Abbott said he will fight to remain Prime Minister. This is his job hangs in the balance with senior cabinet colleagues. In China, the South China Morning Post says China yesterday vowed to spearhead research into genetically modified food with its top agricultural policymaker insisting that imports should not dominate the domestic market.
Before we go to an ad break, let's just take a quick look at what's happening across the country today. Uh, now, yeah, in Johannesburg, there we have Bernard Hotz, head of Worksman's Attorneys, Business and Crime Forensics Practice, will brief the media on terrorism funding in South Africa and Africa in Santon. We'll try and get Bernard into the studio a little bit later in the week. We stay in the City of Gold. The DA's parliamentary leader, Musi Mamani, will lead a demonstration in support of what the party calls breaking Eskom's monopoly on power supply. And how is that going to make the short-term solutions better for all of us here in South Africa, I ask? Looks a bit like a publicity stunt, doesn't it? Now, in Parliament, Cape Town, the Parliament, Parliamentary Secretary, Gengezi Ngilana, is expected to brief the media on preparations for the State of Nation address that takes place on the 12th of February. That's where we're going to have to leave you for now. Newsroom will be back with you after a short little break. Gut feeling about other people's gut feeling. Naba has continued the tradition of passing stories onto the next generation using a platform that owes stories to a far more greater audience. Some may not go, go unless you tell them to go. This is what the audience is all over the world new fellow Kuti for. Join Musam Kalipi on Afro Show Biz every Saturday at 19:30 CAT. Welcome back. Xenophobic attacks are unlikely to end soon with the attitude towards foreign shop owners operating, especially in Soweto, hardening further and further. Local shop owners have joined residents' calls to drive foreign shop owners out of the township. They've also vowed to protect their own territory. The message to the Minister of Small Business Enterprises, Lindy Zulu, was very clear. Support us on this resolution and nothing less. The meeting was called after some foreign shops were looted and set alight. Now, the Black Business Council says foreign nationals must be barred from trading in Soweto. To crown it all, foreign nationals were barred from the meeting to present their side of the story. The minister's appeal for the protection of foreigners also fell on deaf ears, it seems. Now, joining us in the studio is the president of the Black Lobby Group, the Black Business Council, Mr. Ndabin Thele. Very good morning to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning to you and good morning to the viewers. Is that accurate? Do you really want foreign nationals to not trade in townships? Yeah, let's put it uh, in the right perspective. Uh, it is correct that we are not going to allow people that trade without uh, following the rules. And these rules are not African rules. These are international rules. Any foreigner that gets into a country, there are rules that must be followed. There's a certain amount of money that you must uh, 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 first, at, uh, bring in the country, like in New Zealand, they say 1.5 million US dollars. Now, all these foreigners, they didn't follow the rules. We, we don't want to have a state where the rule of law or the game is not played fairly. Is it a little bit late in the game now to suddenly be calling on these rules when they've never been policed before, now suddenly on the back of xenophobic attacks, we try and put the onus on and, and use this almost as an excuse to bar people from, from trading in the townships as they have been for the last 20 years. Yeah, let's not uh, use uh, the term xenophobic attack. Uh, we are enforcing that the rule of law, as it happened globally, must happen in the townships in South Africa. Anybody that comes here must follow the rules and apply. Whether they've been doing this uh, 20 years, uh, as, you, as you are saying, uh, that they did 20 years ago, and I don't believe that started 20 years ago in the new democracy. They came in and is increasing, but somebody and the residents have to protect their territory uh, so that we, as Black Business Council, can create uh, sustainable uh, businesses in the townships. What is your stand on xenophobia? 
and violence against foreign nationals doing business in South Africa? Uh, look, this xenophobia is misconstrued here. Uh, we, 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 we're talking about business space, and uh, this doesn't happen anywhere. I ask uh, you, what the, is the, your stand the, as the, the Black the, Business the, Council on xenophobia, sir? Uh, let me uh, tell you, uh, foreigners that are in the country, I've employed some of them that came the right channel. Those that didn't follow the rules uh, is something that I don't, uh, as Black Business Council, is something that we don't adhere to. Uh, we don't want it to happen. We have to stop it uh, with the, uh, all the uh, resources that we have here is policing, is home affairs. That, that, they've got to do that. Well, we understand that with South Africa's history, it's very difficult to, to understand the mentality. How do you think this will change the image of South Africa in the rest of the African continent? Look, there's nothing wrong with it. Let me tell you a good example. I went in and, and, uh, to go to two prisons in, uh, in Nigeria, myself, my company, and I was asked to follow the rules of the Nigerians. Uh, and I was asked to put a certain amount of investment. They didn't say because you are African like us, you bypass the rules. And so is other big companies, like checkers, uh, your pick and pay, that goes to do business in the continent. We follow the rules. So we are not going to say because we've got democracy here, the rules must not be followed. Uh, we're not here to run a banana banana republic. We no, it's, it's not a banana republic, sir, but is. the precedent has been set. A precedent has been set where this has not been policed to now change our tune to say now the rule of law must apply. It puts us in a very difficult position it's and makes us look almost hypocritical on this issue. No, 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 no. Uh, if, if all the people that are trading there, all of them have got, they came through the right channels, uh, it's going to be acceptable. That's a starting point. If they didn't come through the right channels and the rule of law, this conflict is going to come in again. So we believe that let's not paper over the cracks. Let's solve and come with a permanent solution. The solution you say is let's take stock of who's, who, who's trading and let's start again by issuing licenses and the whole like from, from scratch in order to protect business in the township. Yeah, I'm not saying we must issue licenses. These people, they also have got to be checked whether they're here illegally. For instance, let me tell you something. Uh, there's a bars in this country. They say our uh, small business must copy uh, what these foreigners are doing. In this world, you cannot copy a system that is underworld. Uh, this system uh, that is underworld. If you look underworld, you, you're calling this an underworld system? Uh, okay, let me, let, let me justify Can you just it. qualify uh, that let statement? Let me qualify that statement. The goods that are sold there, if you, you go and buy those goods, those goods are not manufactured in South Africa. The other come from Pakistan or from, from India. And if you check further, uh, these goods, including the cigarettes, they come through our borders that are porous. So it's not a system that you can understudy. Uh, is it is a difficult system? So for people, it's a, it's a for, broad generalization that you make. Uh, no, no, it has it, to be it, investigated. No, 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 surely, it, no, no, it, it's, uh, it's factual. You know, I didn't come and wake up here, uh, not having gone to. Uh, I, I was born and bred in this township, and uh, I started my business in the township. Uh, I, I, I went and uh, we checked with the business council, the goods that are there. And then you ask where, how did this thing come? Uh, nobody will give an explanation. It's not an assumption. It's factual. Uh, and uh, I'm not here to push emotions. I'm here to create, and the, the, the duty of the Black Business Council is to create sustainable small businesses. We cannot, because we cannot even create industrialists when we are going to have goods that come back door, which are very, very cheap, and then people are going to go for these goods. Yeah. And then these uh, guys who are selling these goods for us, uh, there's going to be unfair competition. I thank you for joining us today. So I would just like to point out we have a, a very troubled history of South, South Africa. Most of our leaders were refugees in other countries, and most of the people trading in this country are also refugees. And maybe we should look at a two 
two-tier solution where we not only look at ourselves, but we also look at those that we have to look after. Thank you for joining us. Sorry, our leaders were not trading in exile. All of them, I can tell you that. That's something different. So for thank, us to... Thank you. We, we, we'll leave it there, so we'll have to come okay, back great. another day. We're running, we're running out of time. But okay. I thank you for joining us today. That's the president of the Black Business Council, Mr. Ndaban Thela. Thank you for, for giving us your unique, unique insights into this problem we are all facing uh, here in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a quick look at your views. What are you saying? Uh, I suppose Malamalele folks are living under the illusion Gazankulu is still existent. It wasn't a fully-fledged region, even under Nsanwisi, says Ochosi uh, Makulela Tseleng. Dumukulu, of course, uh, says the, du the municipal service delivery is really concerning. Immediate action and solution is required with regards to Malamalele. Of course, it's a story we've been running on all our platforms for the whole week. I'm Hendrik says government sent cops and soldiers at Malamalele, but residents calling for their own municipality. Is there a break in communications here? That's a question from I'm Hendrik. Some of the, those are some of your views uh, today. The tweet of the day is one sent by Buyo Yakani. Incidents of racism, xenophobia, tribalism and sexism that usually arouse condemnation at national level are actually a microcosm, a microcosm of the bigger picture. Nice one, Buyo. Thank you very much. Buyo Yakani sending us that, well, his view. And we think it's the view of the day. Let's take a look at what's on our news and Facebook page. Today you'll see there uh, Zimbabwe has come under the human rights spotlight once again. Barely three days after its president, Robert Mugabe, was elected to the African Union chair position. This report, which claims that the government used violence and harassment to forcibly relocate 20,000 flood victims of the Torquay Mukorshi Dam disaster in 2014, was released. And then you'll see that residents of Majakaneng have challenged the national and provincial government to investigate problems relating to the lack of clean drinking water in their area. You can find all of those stories on our newsroom Facebook page or visit our SABC News website at sabc.co.za forward slash news for all the latest updates. We'll be back with you after a short break. Well, they've come to the wrong camera. I'm so busy working here. But let's go to Katrine, where they're busy with the head. Where she give us the headline shortly. <laughs> oh, thank you, Evan. Yes, let's just take a look at those top stories this morning. At least 12 people have reportedly been killed when a Taiwanese Trans-Asia plane carrying 58 people crash-landed in a Taipei River in Taiwan. Rescue teams are alongside the plane trying to rescue about 30 people still trapped inside. Before falling into the river, the plane avoided tall buildings, but its wing hit a bridge and a taxi on the bridge. 
Back in South Africa, the situation appears calm in the Limpopo town of Malamulele and surrounding areas following public violence this week. Police will move to clamp down on the unrest so that schooling and services can resume. The area has been shut down for four weeks. Protesters have shut the town down in their demand for a separate municipality after complaints about poor service delivery from the Tula Mela municipality. And in Gauteng, the Johannesburg bus company Ria Vaya says that they won't operate any of their services for a third day in a row. This as their bus drivers continue to strike. Ria Vaya spokesperson Dumisani Mutambo says that they will inform the public by the end of business today when they will be operational again. The city of Johannesburg has meanwhile said that its officials are discussing the process of refunding passengers who have loaded funds onto their smart cards for bus services. I remember all those top stories and more are all available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can then also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Well, Eben, back to you. We're a little bit slow on the uptake today, but we'll try and speed it up as we carry on with Newsroom here this morning. Changing focus a little bit, our elephants and rhinos are not the only animals at risk poaching here in South Africa. Vultures are now hitting the red line as well. While they're believed to have magical powers that can foresee the future, the vulture brains are dried and crushed and smoked to provide traditional medicine. Medicine used to predict lottery numbers, they say. Know the answers to test crash questions and also attract new business. Now, previous reports that rhino and elephant poachers poison these birds so they don't attract rangers to the poaching sites now. That's very concerning to talk to us, to talk to us about this. We're joined by in our, in our Cape Town, is it Cape Town studio? No, it's in our Pretoria studio by Kerry Walter from Volpro and also from the traditional healers organization of South Africa. We're joined by Andile Mashinini. Very good morning to you, Andile. Thank you for joining us. Morning. Thanks for having me here. Can I, can I start with Kerry in Pretoria? Good morning, Kerry. Are you there? Yes, morning. Hi. Kerry, just, just set the scene for us. Where are we with regards to the numbers of vultures and the poaching scenarios that we are seeing here in South Africa? Okay, if we look at the numbers, you know, we, we know more or less about the population of the Cape vulture, and you're looking at under 4,000 breeding pairs left globally. Then you take the African whiteback vulture, which is Africa's commonest vulture species, and they've just been uplisted to endangered because of the rate of its decline, and mostly due to poisonings and power line collisions and electrocutions. So, you know, the, the species are not doing well at all throughout the world, as well as South Africa and Southern Africa, and poaching is definitely on the increase. And trading is totally illegal, is that so? Correct. Any um, handling of vultures, even if you, if, you, if you have a vulture feather, you need permits for it. So any vulture parts, whether it be live, dead, etc., even transporting a species, um, a vulture species, is totally illegal. I want to come to you, Andy, and talk about where vultures fit in in traditional medicine. Is there still disbelief? And... Do you still see the trade in vulture body parts and the like here in South Africa? It's there, but uh, the problem is that most of our healers are, are, are not being informed and, and they, they don't know anything about poaching and all that. But the main important thing is that the, 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 the Department of uh, Environment and uh, Management should create some programs and, 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 and with THO so that we can... Uh, pass the information to, 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 to our healers and, and, and traditional healers to acknowledge that these birds are, are endangered, you know, in our, in our environment. So we should make some programs to uh, conserve this, this, um, our environment, you know. Kerry, just tell us the effect that traditional medicine has on the decline of vultures and then a response to what Andile has just told us. Look, I don't think anyone's been able to to accurately determine, you know, how many vultures are being used um, for traditional uh, means. Um, we do know that the numbers are increasing and have been steadily increasing since the National Lotto uh, came into play. Um, 
So it's, it's a very difficult um, question to answer because a lot of it is kind of um, kept quite secret and under the table. So so very difficult to actually determine accurate numbers, um, you know, uh, accurately. And then in response, you know, Volpro would be more than happy to assist and develop programs and to work with traditional healers with regards to education um, and trying to change the perceptions, you know, that these birds are not clairvoyant. They, they can't help, you know, individuals win lottos or exams, etc. You know, they, they have an important role to play in our ecosystem and we are absolutely more than happy to help spread that word and work together with, with the tra traditional healers. Andila, tell us, what, what, what are the beliefs around the, the superpowers that vultures can give you uh, within traditional medicine? We see in, in, in other countries, uh, uh, you know, the, the reason why the rhino is on the brink as well is because there's a belief that, you know, it gives men potency or whatever. You see, the problem is that people believe anything that they hear without being, without being proven or anything. That these vultures, they, they do not uh, uh, do... Like, they, they cannot help you win lottery, you know? It, it, it's only a, a myth. Mm. It's something that has not been proven. So the, the, these traditional healers that do that, or these witchcraft doctors that do that, they, it, it, it's a bogus thing. They, yeah. they, they're spreading the wrong information. Because we as healers, there are many plants that we use in substitute yeah. of these vultures to, 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 to give you luck, to, to, to give you wealth and all that. So there are certain plants that we can use to, to, to substitute these vultures and stop them from being extinct. Yeah. And another thing is that we, 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 we as traditional healers are not the ones that are poaching these vultures. Yeah. They are traders that come to us with these vultures, yes. you know, and, and want us to buy them from them. Yes, yeah, so, but there, there, it seems there is a market for it. But tell us, how are, you, are you battling with bogus doctors and traditional healers that operate in your name in this country? Yes, it's a, it, you see, the problem is that it's a very thin line between healers and witchcraft doctors between yeah. traditional practitioners and witchcraft doctors. It's a very thin line because it, 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 you, you can just not come to a person and tell you that you, you are a witchcraft or I'm a, I'm a healer. It's, it's a very thin line because the practice itself is very broad. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the, the things that we use, yes, we do use plants and herbs and, and animal parts, but we, 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 we use them in a certain way. We, we don't just poach and take an animal and go yeah. and use it. We, we use some parts which maybe like from a dead uh, a bird or maybe a dead rhino or maybe we can go to some of the reserves and ask for those parts or animal fats or animal yeah. uh, stuff. Yeah, so it's not a question of going to take them out of nature. That's not what no. you guys do as a traditional healers organization. Yes. Uh, just give us your response to that, Kerry, and then what kind of interventions would you like to see in the short term? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the first part of the question. No, just your response to uh, what Andile said. Thank you. And then if you can tell us what kind of short-term interventions you'd like to see. Okay, look, I, I completely agree with what is being said. And, and I'm actually quite enlightened and uplifted, uplifted that there is a potential opportunity that one can explore various educational opportunities, but also working with traditional healers and trying to change the myths and perceptions, which I think is fantastic. Um, and one thing I would like to also get across there is the poachers that are going out and killing these birds, you know, if they're using things like poisons, it means that those birds and that species that's been exposed to poisons actually becomes incredibly dangerous for man as well. So, you know, you're placing people at jeopardy if mm. you're going out and poisoning vultures, etc. And I think that's really important to get out there because potentially, you know, instead of looking at traditional healing, a person can end up becoming incredibly sick because of what a vulture has been exposed to. And that is their job, you know, to, to consume carcasses that have been exposed to various diseases. And I think that's really important um, to get out there. Kerry, thank you very much for joining us. I'd like you to connect with us after the show. I'd like to put you into, into direct contact with Andile. I think there's a conversation to be had between yourselves at Valpro and the traditional healers organization here in South Africa. I think the interventions should start with all of us and should start almost immediately. Thank you for joining us. We'll be in contact with you straight after the show. Thank you very much. Andile, just your final remarks before we carry on. You've got 30 seconds. Uh, all I can say is that um, we are aware of the uh, poaching of these birds and we are going to, 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 
talk to uh, certain departments about it, like the environmental department, on uh, implementing some programs and go to these people and, and, and try to spread the word, the information about it, you know? Yeah. Like, make them aware that this, what they're doing is wrong. Poaching is wrong. But we're not saying that don't use the animals, but have a way of, of, of communicating and do it in the right way. Let's know? regulate it and let's do it without the risk of losing everything. Exactly. Thank you very much for joining us. Andile Mashinini, who is the, well, who is from the traditional healers organization uh, here in Africa. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Yes, we all need to do our little bit, even you at home. Is there something that you can do? Is there something you know about? Let's try and chip in. On Monday, Monday past this is, the world celebrated World Wetlands Day. The theme of this year's celebration is wetlands for our future. It's estimated that more than 64% of the world's wetlands have disappeared. Over the years, wetlands have been used as dumping sites and in some cases have been drained to try and prevent malaria. Now, from our studios in Cape Town, uh, we are joined well, from Wessa by Philippa Huntley, a senior environmentalist. A very good morning to you, Philippa. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having us here. Philippa, let's start with the crux of it. Why is it important for us to, to uh, conserve and preserve our wetlands? Well, wetlands are just so special. They're the most um, diverse and productive systems. And as you said earlier, they are also incredibly threatened. Um, the stats you gave earlier are from the Ramsar Secretariat, um, where scientists have uh, now worked out that in the last century, we've lost globally 64% of our wetlands, which is just an incredible statistic. Um, and the South African research also supports that. Um, in 2012, the National Biodiversity Assessment um, worked out that wetlands are the most critically endangered ecosystem type in the country. So it's very, very important that we recognize how valuable they are for us, the functions they perform for us, and then also that they're just so threatened and that we have to look after the wetlands that are remaining. What, what role does, uh, do they play within the ecosystem? Tell us how important they are. Um, healthy wetlands perform a whole range of roles. For example, they purify water. They also act like a giant sponge. So they hold water and release it slowly during dry seasons. So that's very important in times of drought. A healthy wetland would be the one place where you would find some water still remaining in, in the natural system. Um, wetlands also typically provide the most amazing places for recreation, um, bird watching, canoeing on the bigger systems, walking, hiking, a whole range of ecotourism opportunities. Um, as I said earlier, they act like a giant sponge. Not only is that good in terms of storing water, but it can also help with flood attenuation. So if there's a big flood in a river system, if there's a healthy wetland in place, it's going to make the flood less severe. It's going to make the flood less bad, basically, for the downstream users, people and, and part of the natural environment downstream would naturally be protected if yeah. there was a big flood and there was a healthy wetland in place. Yeah. What about, what about, so they perform a whole range of functions. What about somewhere like KwaZulu-Natal where, you know, despite all the heavy rains we see, flooding and the like, we hear about drought in KwaZulu-Natal. I'm almost flabbergasted to hear that. But what role would a, a wetland then play in that? Is it the conserving of water within that ecosystem? Yes. Um, wetlands help both in terms of water quality and quantity. Um, like I said earlier, this giant sort of sponge function that they perform um, helps to store water. So in times of drought, they would be storing the water. W wetlands also help in terms of water purification. Hmm. So typically the water going into a wetland, um, as it passes through the wetland, through the action of the plants and the microbes in the wetland, it gets purified. So that helps with water quality as yeah. well. So they perform a whole range of functions that we, we call that ecosystem services, um, basically stuff that nature is doing for us as humans for free that's benefiting us and the environment. And, and World Wetlands Day was on Monday. What, what, was the, what were the outcomes there? Yes. Um, it was absolutely fantastic here in Cape Town. We've got a brand new Ramsar site. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Ramsar just now. 
But um, we have an absolutely brand new Ramsar site, the 22nd Ramsar site in South Africa. Um, and it's at a place called False Bay Ecology Park, right in the heart of the city. It's the most wonderful wetland system. The deputy minister um, addressed the people at the event. Um, and that for us was a wonderful way of celebrating World Wetlands Day. Um, as the name suggests, it's World Wetlands Day, so it's celebrated um, all over the world. Um, and we always have an event here um, to acknowledge that. And this year, obviously, it was a very, very big event um, and very special to have got a Ramsar site declared right in the heart of the city. Philippa, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Just give us the website that people can go visit. If you go to the WESA website, WESA.org, um, you'll find more information about the work we do and okay. links to the Wetland Society as well. Thank you very much. That's Philippa Huntley coming to you live from Cape Town, giving us an update on the state of our wetland uh, year in South Africa and the world. 64% gone. That's not a good statistic. It's not been a good environmental day on the show today. Let's hope that we can all chip in and do a little bit, not for ourselves, but for our future generations. You don't want one of those futuristic movies where we all live in the, in the atmosphere because Earth is not inhabitable anymore. Where are we heading there? That's where we leave it today. Newsroom is broadcast live from our studios here in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. The show repeats at 2 in the afternoon with the rebroadcast at uh, 5 a.m. the following morning. We also stream live on YouTube at that time with the whole show available on demand on our YouTube channel throughout the day, actually throughout the whole of the year. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We love it in the morning.